Hi, everybody. I'm Carl, and welcome to Freedom Calvary's Wednesday night service. How's everybody? Everybody's hanging out in the back. It's all, it's all kind of, it's crazy, yeah. Nobody wants to sit up front, which I don't blame them, because I hate sitting up front, too. It's just that, well, my wife does. Opposites attract in church. She's a fronter, and I'm a back rower, and you never know when you got to go to the bathroom or something. You know, it's just, suddenly your bladder says now, and you, so, anyway, we are working our way through the life of Jesus chronologically across all four Gospels, and tonight we are in Matthew chapter 19. I bet you thought I was going to say Luke, didn't you? No, we are in Matthew chapter 19. All right, we're going to start in verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, is it better not to marry? But he said to them, All cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him Accept it. And this is the word of the Lord. Father, thank you that we, uh, we get to do this one more time. I think if we all had our choice, uh, we'd prefer that you come back. But if we're going to be stuck here, uh, let us keep being able to have Wednesday nights where we gather and we dig deeper into your word and we, we listen we listen for your voice. We listen for you to speak out of this text. Through me, through each other. Lord, just speak to us tonight. That's why we're really here. Nobody really actually cares what I have to say. We're all here hoping to hear from you. So come as you promised. Fill this place with your spirit as we gather in your name. Be among us and teach us what you would have us to learn from this passage. And all of this I ask in the beautiful and blessed name of Jesus. Amen. So, um, our hero is preparing his disciples for his impending death and eventual departure physically from the earth. The message, if you have ears to hear it, is one of hope. The message for both them and us is that while Jesus must die and return to the right hand of God the Father, he will come again. Specifically, Jesus is referring to the time he will return to catch up those who believe in him 
before the judgment of God will be poured out on the unbelieving world. Seeing our God, Savior, and King return to take us home, to be with Him, is the sustaining hope of every true Christian. It's what we're waiting for. Please, Lord Jesus, come. I just gave away my next line. Lest you think I'm exaggerating that point, consider how the, this whole book, this whole book ends. Revelation 22, 20 and 21. He who testifies to these things, that's Jesus, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The inspired writer of the book of the last, the final book of the New Testament, closes by reminding us of the words of our Savior. Surely I am coming quickly. After hearing all of the terrible things that are going to befall the world, Jesus chooses to strengthen us with the promise of his return. Also, you can skip pretty much everything in that book if you believe in him and are waiting for his return. It is really the whole hope of the whole thing, Jesus and his return. So, Along with the promise of his return, Jesus tells us that those who long for his return make themselves ready for that return. And through a series of interactions, he shows us what that looks like, how we practically are ready. Altogether, uh, Jesus showed us, told us about four ways in which we make and keep ourselves ready for his return. First one is by not getting attached to this world or anything in it. Two, by praying always and not losing heart. Three, staying humble before God. And four, being childlike in our dependence on God's blessings. Now it seems at this point Jesus is shifting gears after getting a question from the Pharisees on the issue of divorce. Out front, I'm going to tell you this is a tough message to give. And I imagine it will be a tough message to listen to. Um, why? Why? Because we live in a society where a huge, huge, a way too big percentage of marriages wind up in divorce. Depending on what numbers you look at, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of all first marriages in the United States end in divorce. It's worse than other countries, better in some. And the numbers actually get worse with second and third marriages. It's not like you figure it out and you do better next time. Yeah, the second marriages fail 65% of the time, and, and third marriages a whopping 73% of the time. That's just brutal. And divorce is ridiculously destructive. Most psychologists and psychiatrists will tell you that divorce is equivalent to experiencing a death. It is. The fallout from a divorce never falls on just the people splitting up and impacts sometimes deeply everyone connected to either party in a divorce. It is devastating. When 40 to 50 percent of marriages fail, it is almost a statistical certainty that every single person in this room or watching has been affected in some way by divorce. When we hear what God's standard for marriage and divorce is, especially if you don't know it already, it is going to make you squirm. It's going to affect you on some level. Now, by my count, this is the third time Jesus has talked about or taught on divorce. The first was during the Sermon on the Mount, which was early in his ministry and now in the waning days of his ministry. He's commented on it twice. The second time was in Luke 16, just before the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And now here we have number three. So twice in a very short period of time, Jesus is talking about divorce. Jesus teaches on the same thing, and each time says pretty much the exact same thing, that it must be important. So as much as I would like to, we cannot simply skip or gloss over this. It's something we have to talk about. 
Jesus talked about it. We need to talk about it. And on a personal level, this hits home for me. I have been divorced. Again, if you're coming here to hear someone who's got it all figured out and doing it right, this might not be the service for you. Um, sitting up here and teaching this hurts on a... Re- and I feel ridiculously hypocritical doing it. Which is actually the case most weeks on pretty much everything I teach on. And so, um, this week it's, it's, it's a bit more obvious and thus more glaring and embarrassing than most weeks. Most weeks your sin is, you know, hidden in private. And this one's right out there and everybody can see it and know about it. And so, it's, this is tough. But is our goal to be comfortable? It's not. It's to know and to dig into everything Jesus preserved and passed down to us from his time here on earth. The main points of this teaching appear in all three of the synoptic gospels, twice in Matthew and once each in Mark and Luke. This particular teaching on divorce is paralleled in Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. Very similar retelling. Verse 1 and 2. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan and great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. And I hope a couple of people are going, wait a minute, didn't we do this? I thought Jesus said, I hope a couple of people, one, I'd be happy if it was one, is going, hey, I thought we... Jesus leaving Galilee is something we looked at in the past. We've covered this already. Matthew and Mark's gospel accounts do not cover the initial period Jesus spent in the area of Perea beyond the Jordan River. Almost all of Luke chapter 11 through chapter the middle of chapter 18 with sections from John on the healing of the man born blind and the fallout of plus the raising of Lazarus from the dead, all would shoehorn right here. Like everything we've covered for maybe the last 10 or 12 weeks would fit right here. If it was in Matthew, if it was in Matthew and Mark's gospel. Um, so this would actually be uh, the second time that Jesus has come to this region after having been here for a couple of months before leaving to go to Judea again to raise Lazarus from the dead. So he's returned to where we started prior to the raising of Lazarus from the dead. He's made this circle up, and I don't have the map out this week, sorry. But Jesus has found his way back to Perea on the edges of Judea. Um, Jesus is making a wide sweeping journey to Jerusalem. In one sense, he is biding time because the day for his final return to Jerusalem was ordained before the foundations of the world were set in place, and thus he cannot return before then. He's also trying to stay beyond the grasp of the religious leaders in Judea and Jerusalem because they are dead set on killing him at this point. He's not afraid. He's just working within the natural world. People want to kill him, so he's staying where he's supposed to be till it's time to be where he's supposed to be. Verse 3, the Pharisees also came to him, testing him, saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? So some some Pharisees have approached Jesus with a question. And know this, they are not pure of heart. They are not coming seeking instruction or enlightenment. They're here to test him. Text tells us they come to test him, which you should read as trip him up. They're here to try and find something to accuse him over. Forcing him, they want to do this by forcing him to take sides in a controversy. Once they've done that, once he's taken a side, the Pharisees can whipsaw Jesus' opinion one side against the other in their never-ending quest to discredit and destroy him in the eyes of the people. So what is the controversy they're trying to get Jesus in the middle of? The controversy is over the application of the commands concerning divorce 
that are given by Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Verse 1 indicates that a man may divorce his wife if he finds some uncleanness in her. Now there are two major schools of thought within the Pharisee sect. They're kind of like subsects of the sect of Phariseeism. The subsects were centered around the teachings of two teachers who had competing schools which provided religious training for up-and-coming Pharisees. One was the Shammai school, and the other was the Hillel school. Hillel just rolls off a lot better than Shammai. Just the controversy arose in the interpretation of the word uncleanness. The Shammai school taught that uncleanness meant adultery or some form of sexual immorality. Thus, the only reason for which one could divorce his wife was if she cheated on him or participated in some other sexual Im sexually immoral act. That's their opinion. The Hillel school taught that uncleanness meant pretty much just about anything. And I do mean almost anything. Anything that you could find displeasing about your life, which meant you could divorce your wife for pretty much anything. And they did. If your wife put on a few pounds, that's an uncleanness. She can go. If you don't like what she does, uh, the way she dresses or wears her hair, that's an uncleanness. She's gone. If she talks badly about you to others, that's an uncleanness. She's gone. If she talks badly about your mama, she can go. If, if she does not have dinner ready when you get home, if the house isn't clean, if she burns your dinner or puts too much salt on your kebabs, if she bears you daughters only and no sons, if she is barren and can't give you any children at all, that's an uncleanness. Even if you find someone that is prettier than her, that you would rather marry, then her holiness compared to your new girl would be an uncleanness so you can divorce her. That's how ridiculous this has gotten. As you might imagine, this interpretation of the rule concerning divorce was rather popular among the men of the day. Basically, what the Hillel school had done it was found a way to make adultery legal. Well, the Shammai school took the obviously more conservative originalist view of what uncleanness was, they did not condemn or excommunicate those who agreed with or practiced what Hillel taught. So while they theoretically disagreed with the Hillel school, in practice, they were okay with it. Now the Pharisees were attempting to get Jesus to weigh in in favor of one or the other of these competing interpretations of the law. If Jesus comes down on the side of the Shammai school, then he will instantly be unpopular with those who favor the liberal view of the Hillel school, which was, as we said, very popular among the men folk. Back those days, you didn't lose half your stuff when you got divorced. You gave her a paper and that was pretty much it, and she was out the door, so there was no skin off the man's nose. If Jesus comes down on the side of the Hillel school, then he does, he, he isn't really a lover of the law. Everybody, which tells you, they all know that the Hillel school interpretation is wrong. It's, it's, they're playing really dirty. They believe that they have Jesus in a trick bag no matter how he answers. And on a side, fall, side note, with no-fault divorces being the law in all 50 states, now the United States of America has officially taken the side of the Hillel school when it comes to divorces. Verse 4. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female. Now what the men confronting Jesus wanted him to do was to cite one of the two rabbis and thus come down on one side or the other. Hello, Shammai. 
And that's what leaders did back then. That's what rabbis did back then. They very seldomly taught, this is what I think, this is, really, this is what God has revealed to me. Well, Rabbi Shemil, Shemil said 230 years ago in the Shemitah that this is, that's all they did. They cited old dead guys. That was their authority. <laughs> but Jesus doesn't do what they want. He never does. Jesus really is the rebel with a cause. He says, I'm going to set you straight on the whole thing because both of those guys are wrong. Both of them are wrong. And, and the have you not read was often used as an opening line when one rabbi wanted to dispute another's teaching. And it would have been heard as an insult, as if, <laughs> as if we haven't read the Torah, really. No, well, when you're spending all your time reading the Mishnah, how much time do you have for the Torah? And Jesus says, I'm not going to cite any rabbi. I'm going to cite the authority. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cite God, what God himself said. And his reference, his citation, is Genesis 120, 127 and 5, 2. God created two distinct beings in his likeness and image, a man and a woman, Ish and Isha. Each created at a different time and by a different method. First man was formed out of the dust of the earth and given breath, the very breath of God, to quicken him. While at a later time, woman was formed around a piece of something. It says there's a rib bone. We don't really know. Something removed from the man, and the woman is formed around that. While created at seven times and in distinctly different ways, they were literally created one for the other. The ideal state in which men and women are to exist is in a partnership with the one whom God created for them as their complement and helpmate. That's the way we're designed. God has for each person designed and manufactured, so to speak, someone out there who is your complement. One exception that comes up at the end, and we'll mention that, but God actually creates people in matching pairs. And if you will wait upon him and follow his lead, then he will bring that person to you in his time, just like he did the first man and woman. Too many of us don't have the patience for that. We make dumb decisions. And then we get into situations. And I cannot tell you if the person you are with is the person God designed you to be with, but if you're with them, they are. They are now. That is God's design and plan. Men and women were by design designed to be together. Verses 5 and 6. And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Marriage was instituted by God. Sun, moon, stars, plants, trees, animals, man, woman, marriage. It's that old. If you create and found something, if you start an institution, and the people in the institution were formed out of, by your hand, and, and you kind of get to define what its purpose is. As a creator, you naturally design things with a purpose in mind. And you design and create to fill that design by design. 
So if your creation has a purpose and it is designed to fill that purpose, any attempt to make it do or function as something else or in any other way than it was designed and for the purpose for which it was designed, it will not work right. Knives are not meant to be used as screwdrivers. If you do that, you will most likely wreck something. Eating soup with a fork simply doesn't work very well. An hour or two later, you might have some of the soup in your mouth, but it would work better with a spoon. And if you have a spoon and you try to cut a steak with it, you will mostly be frustrated. Man was designed to be married to one woman and women were designed to be married to one man for life. That's the way God set it up. That is why Christians get upset when government or societal forces try to redefine marriage as something other than one man and one woman together for life. We believe marriage is not a human institution as the secular world would have you to believe. It is a holy institution created by God and any attempt to define it any other way than the way God defines it is an affront to God himself. So of course we get a little touchy about it. You're basically saying what God said is a lie or you are dismissing God as the ultimate authority and, and setting yourself up as an authority over something he clearly designed. In doing that, trying to take charge over something that belongs to God has never, ever worked out well for anyone. And if you look at the world around us, you can see the fruit of that rejection of God's plan everywhere. Much of our world's trouble is a direct result of the redefinition and destruction of marriages and families. The union described here is the only one truly blessed by God. By blessed by God, I mean that is the only type of union that will work right because it was designed to work that way. Just because you call a dog a cow does not make him a cow. And a lot of people would like to say that this is an antiquated idea uh, for the day and the time in which it was given, and, and we've got to change with the times, and, it, and what, what's going on here just really doesn't apply today. And that is absolutely untrue. In fact, it's the opposite that's true. The command by God is totally forward-thinking. Think about this for a minute. It was totally given for the future. It had to be. Think about it. Adam and Eve had no parents to go back to. They had no parents to actually leave. They were created and not born. And there was no one else for them to marry except each other. This actually could not and did not really apply to them. It was for the future. And marriage by design is something more than merely a relationship. It is something for which you forsake and leave the people to which you have the closest bonds to. Your parents, you actually have the same flesh and blood as your mother and father. And yet God says, for marriage, you walk away from that. Give up everything else you are connected to and give yourself fully to that person whom God designed for you. And in doing that, two separate people made in different ways at different times become one flesh. In God's eyes, one being. Marriage is something God designed and God brings together and no man, no man has the right to break it apart. Marriage is not first a covenant between men and women. 
It's first the covenant between the man and God and the woman and God. And then it's a covenant between the man and the woman. It's that relationship to God and that submission to God and recognizing that God made you both and brought you together that is the glue that keeps the bond between husband and wife together. And no one has the right or authority to undo what God has done. Verse 7, they said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? So the Pharisees are, you know, probably not liking what Jesus is saying. And they're like, well, if we're not supposed to divorce, then why did Moses command? Notice that word, command to give a certificate of divorce. This is a patently false statement. Moses did not command anyone to give certificates of divorce. Didn't happen. And Jesus will attack that very point. Now, some rabbis back then were teaching that it was a command, literally a command, to divorce a displeasing wife. They pushed that it was actually a religious duty to divorce a cantankerous, displeasing wife. And I wonder if their thought process was, it was similar to that of King Ahasuerus. You know, Queen Vashti wouldn't show up, and it made him look bad in front of everybody else. And they're like, yeah, but she's... she's, she's She's kind of cute, and I'd like to keep her around. The rest of the guys are going, no, because all the women in the, are going to hear that they can get away with that, so you need to put this down now. Women were considered by far too many men of that day to be a necessary evil. They needed them to clean house, raise children, and meet their other needs. They did not treat women like the gifts from God made especially for them that they were. Want to know how we got the women's lib movement and, and all that other stuff? Men, look in the mirror. It's because we treated women like property instead of like gifts from God. Verse 8. He said to them, Moses because of the hardness of your hearts permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So to see this, I want you to actually go back. Everybody open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 24. I want you to see the very verse from which this controversy arises. And realize that in Deuteronomy, Moses is reiterating what God has said. It's the retelling of the law just before his death. And he says in verse 1, When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of her house. Notice how it starts. It starts with when this happens. This is how you handle it. This is not in any way, shape, or form a command. Divorce is not the heart of God. The problem is that it is already going on. So what God is doing is putting limits on it. He's saying, I don't approve of it, but if you're going to do it, these are the limits. The law of Moses, in some cases, is not God's perfect will. What God is trying to do is limit what man is doing. And he has done it in such a way, if you really look at it, if you really look at both of these examples, I'm going to give this one and the other one, the way he does it really reveals his heart, his true heart about the subject and what he wants you to do. This is also what he did with slavery. God is not for slavery. Period, paragraph, end of story. God is against slavery. He always was and always will be. 
but slavery was going on already. God put limits on it. In fact, he made it so onerous that there was almost no value in it. If you had a slave, you had to let him go every seven years. So you put all that time and effort into it. You know, it probably takes a couple years to get them straightened out, and, and then they're working good, and then you got to let them go. And, and often, it wasn't like you went out and grabbed someone off the street and made them your slave. It was because they owed you money. So they, they basically sold themselves to you, and, okay, I'll be your slave. And, and, and then... So that's going to really, you know, you, you only got seven years to get your money out of them. And you had to do really nice things for them while they were, when you let them go. I mean, it became actually, by design, um, a, a money-losing proposition. Not only was God putting limits on it, he was trying to wean the people off of those practices that he found displeasure, that, 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 that were wrong. God is doing the same thing here, making the limits on divorce so narrow that there was very few cases where it would actually apply. And God is making this one allowance because he knows how devastating adultery is. So much so that some people cannot get over it and reestablish the relationship. It's God's heart that a marriage lasts and endure anything and everything, even that. But because of our sin nature and inability to forgive, God knows that it is impossible for some to do, and he made this one allowance. But it's not his heart. If you really, if you really, 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 really want to see God's heart on marriage and divorce, read the prophet Hosea. That's God's heart. except kids that you know aren't yours. When she runs away and you go and you, you spend your own money to buy her back. That's God's heart for marriage. Verse 9, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And here, this is the simple standard. Divorce is only allowed when there is sexual immorality. That's the standard. That's God's standard, period. Try it. You can try as much as you want to to read other things into that, and that's God's standard, period. Anyone who divorces for any other reason and moves on to another spouse is, in fact, committing adultery. And that is really what the Hillel interpretation of the laws concerning divorce was doing. It was giving an air of legal cover for adultery, whether they intended it to or not. Now, we do have to add one caveat here to this because the Bible does. The first epistle of Paul to the church in Corinth tells us that there is one other situation in New Testament time in which if a divorce occurs, the party left is allowed to move on with their lives with no guilt. 1 Corinthians 7.15 tells us that if two non-believers are married and one converts to Christianity and the one who didn't convert decides to leave over them following Jesus, then the one who gets left, the believer who's left over their faith, is free to move on. But note that Paul says if the spouse is willing to stay, if the non-believing spouse is willing to stay, wants to stay, then you have to stay married to them. So according to the Bible, there are two and only two conditions under which divorces are allowed and those who divorce can move on. From the mouth of Jesus, any other reason for divorce is invalid, and those who do so and take up with someone else is committing adultery. And that is really hard to hear in our world today. Very hard to hear. 
But please, please don't lose heart. We'll come back to this at the end, I promise. Matthew 19.10 His disciples said to him, If such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. This is one of the few moments when the disciples really get the gravity of what Jesus has just said and then ask a very thoughtful question in response to what was said. Now, being from the Midwest, I want to hear a lot of sarcasm in this. Really, I might as well not even get married. That's what I want to hear, but I doubt that was actually the case. If getting married could lead to divorce and then committing adultery, if getting married could lead me to sin, then maybe it would be better not to get married at all. That's a good question. That's that's a very, very good question in relation to what they've just heard. They're thinking. Verse 11. But he said to them, All cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. So, what Jesus is about to say is not for everyone's ears. Not. And there are in my opinion, a very small and certain group of people to whom what Jesus is about to say applies, and he wants his disciples to know that up front. Those to whom this applies will know, they'll know. And to everyone else, it's not for them. Verse 12, For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's wombs, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by man, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. How many people think we'd ever hear this verse taught on if we weren't going through the Bible line by line, verse by verse? This is just not something you just pick out and go, oh, I'm going to teach on Matthew 19, 12 this week. That's going to be awesome. Now, most of the time, most of the time, I come down on the side of interpreting the Bible literally. But this time, I am almost positive that Jesus is being figurative. And I have several reasons for them which get a little distasteful and maybe not suited for the younger crowd. So I'm going to skip those, and I'm going to go to my last argument, which would be that if Jesus meant this literally, it would apply only to male followers, which it doesn't. It applies to everyone. So eunuch is being used figuratively. Um... Jesus is talking about here those who do not, either by circumstance or choice, marry and choose to abstain from sexual relations. The takeaway here is that some people are indeed called to celibacy for the sake of furthering the work of the kingdom of heaven. There's only one person that I actually know of that I could talk to talk about this about Um, when I was growing up I was a metalhead kid and I still um, I'm now a metalhead adult and um, yeah so um, I love to get these cassette tapes because we were doing cassette tapes back then and and I'm the nerd who gets the cassette tape and unrolls the whole thing and reads the lyrics and reads the liner notes and, and the dedications, and the producer, and because I'm that nerd. And uh, these Christian metal cassettes, uh, Deliverance, and my favorite band at the time was Saint um, that was doing this. And they were all on these off labels, but each of them would give a panel, a whole panel in this fold-out to a guy named Pastor Bob Beeman. And he founded Sanctuary Church in California. I don't know the exact city. I think it was somewhere in Orange County. But he founded Sanctuary. And his outreach was to metal kids. The guys from Striper at various times were um, musical directors in this church. But inside of that, they would give him a little panel. And he'd say, hey, if you heard something in this CD or in this music that makes you want to know Jesus... Or, or speaks to you, please reach out to us. And he had an 800 number. 
and people could call in and hear about Jesus and get talked to and, so, and have the gospel shared with them. And this was in all these cassette tapes and record labels. And, and I, he's, now, uh, he's now doing a homeless ministry in Nashville. Uh, it's the Bridge Group. And every Saturday, Sunday, I think it's up to Friday, Saturday, and Sunday now, he meets under this bridge in Nashville, and he, his, he spends his whole days um, out there gathering food, um, stuff that just expired that day, and taking it down, and he's working with his mother and father. And I read, and he's like, yeah, no, I never married. And, and yeah, he did this in one of his podcasts. He's like, yeah, I never married. It sounded like a great thing, and I, I probably would have really liked it, but... I had this calling on my life and I would not have had the time to give to a wife that she would have deserved. That time would have had to come from somewhere and I would have had to have taken it from God. And so it just never happened for me. And, and there are people like that and God bless them because he's doing some great stuff. And he's still ministering to metalhead kids. He flies all over the world to do um, uh, Christian metal festivals and he's 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 got to be in his late 60s now, and he's still got hair down to here. And it's, it's awesome. I love this guy. And he's out there living, being the hands and feet of Jesus. And, but he chose the calling on his life versus what he thought would bring him pleasure. So, and, and a biblical example would be uh, the Apostle Paul. Whether he was married before he was called to faith or not, we don't know. But he spent his entire time in faith alone and advocated for celibacy. Um, and he talks about this quite a bit in that same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So I want to hit on three things to close out tonight, three things. One, first of all, this is not an all-encompassing teaching on marriage and divorce. It's the bulk of of what matters and, and therefore is the foundation of any right teaching on divorce. It has to start here. There are scenarios and situations about which one may ask individual additional questions in light of this teaching. Most, if not all, of those questions and scenarios are addressed by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and elsewhere in a few other of his epistles. So this is not the be-all, end-all on divorce. But it's the core. Everything. Everything you really need to know concerning God's heart and divorce is in here. If this was all you knew, it would be enough to figure everything else out. That's all Paul really does, is apply this to different situations and then talk about them. Now, two... I began by saying that this would be a hard teaching to hear in our world today. I don't know about you, but it was hard for me to write and it's hard for me to give. And you may be sitting there and suddenly realizing or being forced to remember that in light of what Jesus has said, that you have committed adultery. And in some level, it's ripping your heart out of your chest. And frankly, that's a good reaction to sin. I would be far more worried if this didn't bother you on some level. But please do not lose heart. Jesus did not come into the world and say these things to condemn the world. The world was condemned already. He came that we might recognize our sin, repent, believe in him, and be saved. Neither divorce or adultery is the unforgivable sin. The only thing that will not be forgiven, a person is rejecting Jesus as our God, Savior, and King. If you're guilty of this, then know that Jesus died for this sin, just like every other sin you or I, you or I have committed. We deal with this sin in our lives the way we deal with any other Repent, ask forgiveness, and trust, believe that you have been forgiven when you believed in 
Jesus. Feeling some level of guilt or remorse over this is a good thing, but stewing on it and letting it paralyze you or cause you to doubt your salvation is not good. That's the devil's work. After lamenting over the sinful nature of his flesh, Paul says this in Romans 8.1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We are forgiven of our sin, all of it, even this, even a sin Jesus calls out by name three times in his ministry when we repent of it and follow him. So don't lose heart if this. If you're guilty, repent, follow Jesus, and rejoice that you have been forgiven. Finally, I want to talk about this teaching in context. This is awesome. Now, Matthew and Luke both chronicle that this exchange, this, this teaching, or exchange with the Pharisees, takes place just before Jesus blesses the children, which was the end of last week's teaching, if you remember. So this exchange takes place between the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector and the blessing of the children. That's where it fits chronologically. Now, if you remember, those two things were part of Jesus showing us how to make and keep ourselves ready for his return, right? If both of those tie back to the return of Jesus and this comes in between those two things, then this must as well. For a couple of reasons, I did this teaching separately and out of order from where I went. The main reason was I didn't see how it fit. So I kind of gave myself an extra week, which I didn't need, but there are a couple other reasons why I went ahead and did it this way. I was so, I was so sure that this was just a random teaching that I started doubting the guys who put together the harmony of the gospel. <laughs> I'm going, man, they really, they just really made a mistake here. This can't possibly be where this goes. But after I had made the decision to do this separately this week, I was working on the intro for last week's message when suddenly just God dropped it on me. I think Heather was around at that moment. There was a lot of screaming involved. Let me see if I can build this picture for you. Marriage is a huge deal in the Bible. The first thing God did after creating the world was preside over a wedding. A wedding between the first man and the first woman. It's literally the oldest institution in the world created by God. Why? Why would God do that? Why would the very first thing he did be a wedding? Because Marriage is a picture of the type of relationship God wants to have with us. Unfortunately, when most people think of marriage, they think of in terms of romantic love. That's, that's the big thing. That's how we sell it. Romance. Which I say is unfortunate because in the big picture, it's such a small part of the marital relationship. If that's all you got, you really don't have anything. That's all you got is romance. You don't got much. And how many people focus on that and get married because of romance, and then two years later, five years later, ten years later, it's gone. So romance is a really small part. At the core of a good marriage is letting go of self and a dedication to the well-being of the other person, which leads to a deep and abiding friendship, emotional connection, interdependence, and self-sacrifice. Marriage works the very best when each party is committed to loving and giving themselves on every single level to the other person. That's how it works best. She's giving her all to him. He's giving his all to her. Each living for the joy and the pleasure of the other. 
I'm living for her pleasure and she's living for mine. Everybody's needs get met. You take your joy in the well-being and happiness of the other person and dedicate yourself to bringing them joy and the other person doing the same thing. It's the stuff that dreams are made of. And that really is, at its heart, the essence of what agape love is. Self-sacrificing love. And that is exactly the type of relationship God wants to have with each of us. That intimate, that personal. And has anyone given themselves completely more than God has given himself to each one of us? And he presents himself to us for just such a relationship in the person of Jesus Christ. The most self-sacrificing of anything, any being ever, all time. This is how much I love you. This is what I'm willing to do for you. When you believe in Jesus... It's a betrothal. We are to be wed to Jesus in heaven, in agape love. So this believing in Jesus, this following Jesus, is really a betrothal. And the Bible tells us that we're sealed, and it's a promise. A betrothal is a promise, isn't it? We're sealed for that promise by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is like our engagement ring. In Jewish culture, to be betrothed is like being married without yet living together under the same roof. It is marriage without the consummation. It's legally binding. To get out of a betrothal, you need a divorce. Starting to see it? (laughs) So we as believers are betrothed to Jesus, and what we are waiting for is Jesus, our bridegroom, to come and take his bride home to be with him. Which is what will happen when Jesus returns. So this absolutely connects back to Jesus' teachings on how to make and keep ourselves ready for his return. That final way that we the final way that we do that is by staying faithful to him. Don't go after other gods. Don't worship other things. Don't let our hearts wander away from our true love. Don't cheat on Jesus while you're waiting for him to come back. So there are five ways in which we keep ready for Jesus to return. And this is them in the order that actually Jesus gives them. One, not getting attached to this world or anything in it. Two, praying always and not losing heart. Three, staying humble before God. Four, staying faithful to Jesus. And five, being childlike in our dependence on God's blessings. And if you make it your goal to live like that, it's going to be a beautiful life, I guarantee it. It's going to be awesome, and it's going to be wonderful. And you're going, how do I do that? This This is what love does. This is what love did for you. And when you fall in love with Jesus, this is what you would naturally just do. What we're being called to do, people, is to fall in love with Jesus. And like every other relationship, it takes some maintenance. Sometimes you got to remember how beautiful he is. And sometimes you got to really remember all that he's done for you. And how this ridiculous, stupid amount that he loves you. You practice it. You, You think about it. You dwell on it. You rehearse it in your mind. And you remember. And you remember. And you let that love that he's poured out for you well up out of you 
And that's how you live this life. The love of Jesus in us, flowing back out of us to him. It's beautiful. It's amazing. To see all these different teachings and Jesus is consistently going, no, see it for more. See it for something bigger. And I'd be willing to bet the disciples did not get it at the time until that Holy Spirit came upon them and showed them. And now they got it. And now we get to see it. And it's awesome. Love it when God just drops stuff on us like this. That there's just this opportunity to see there's a, an amazing teaching a hard teaching in it. It's a hard teaching to do. But it was given with hope. It was given with great hope. I'm coming again. I've forgiven you even of this. Stay faithful to me. I'm coming back for you. Father, we thank you so much for the love that you poured out for us. Lord, let us really be filled with that love. Let us really, really take that into our minds and our souls and our hearts. Let us really, really see that. And see it as the source of all the power that we need to do what you've called us to do. And it's nothing on us. It's nothing that we would balk at. It's what we would do out of love. None of it is anything that you haven't already done for us a million times over. Lord, let us fall deeper in love with you today. And Lord, if there's anyone out there that hasn't yet seen your beauty and fallen madly in love with you because you love them first so much, may tonight be that night. And they cry out, and they call out, ask for the forgiveness you offer, all the wonderful promises that come with forgiveness. We love you. We thank you for this time together. I ask you to go with us safely, to take us home, and everybody who's out there, Lord, uh, uh, watching, may your blessing and love and mercy fall on them like rain. Lord, I pray for our country and the horrible time we're going through. I, I just wish your spirit would come down and blanket this country and change the hearts on both sides because there's a lot of ugly, evil, mean nastiness going on on both sides. Lord, you're the only cure. You're the only way we're going to see any change. Revival, Lord, we're calling for revival. And all this I ask tonight in the beautiful, blessed, holy name of Jesus. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Love you. Bye.